morning, we'd like to begin uh, today's forum. I'd like to welcome everybody to the Chicago Leadership Forum, uh, the second series on Christian anthropology. Uh, today's topic is Theology and Anthropology of Marriage. Uh, we're very happy again to have Father Peter DiArminio to be with us and make this presentation. Uh, Pope Benedict XVI, back in 2012, uh, made a statement that you know, resonated with me. Uh, he said that the crisis of faith in modern man has as one of its primary causes the crisis in marriage. In today's forum, Father Peter will explore the following topics. That in the first book of the Bible has revealed marriage as a sacred institution established by God himself. That God has ordered the spouses to like one flesh. The intimate union between a man and a woman is made possible through the complementarity of the sexes. And lastly, the distinction between genders is at the service of life. It is a personification of, of the love between a man and a woman. Uh, we'd like to welcome Father Peter. Well, let's begin with a prayer to the greatest spouse who ever lived, and no one will rival her. The second one is St. Joseph, but I don't have a prayer memorized to him. So we'll say Hail Mary. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Jesus, Mary, and Joseph, pray for us. Okay. Well, I think Mark gave a summary, so I'm just almost tempted to say, why don't you ask some questions? But um, I'm going to pitch this talk sort of the way I did it the last time. I want to begin with a, a scriptural analysis, not exhaustive, of marriage. And then I want to take a bit of a philosophical approach, and then a logical approach. And I won't go over time. I may not finish, but that's how I'm going to pitch this talk. This is about marriage. It's not about an analysis of heterosexual attraction or same-sex attraction. Just for the record, my love for people and my esteem for people transcends that. Um, what I want to talk about is an objective analysis of the institution of marriage. Why was I invited to give this talk? I'm not a marriage expert, but now, in this culture of so-called intolerance, if you even sheepishly say, well, I'm just going to go with the philosophical tradition that, goes, that has uh, taken place millennia before Christ, and I just recognize marriage between a man and a woman, in many instances you are creating an unsafe place. I was able to give a talk on transgender. Um, I have to admit that it was only in a small group. Um, I hope the Lord forgives me for the uh, fear of having tomatoes thrown at me. Uh, there And then I gave a talk on marriage, and I got away with it because at the University of Chicago, the president has said, at least in that institution, uh, there's no such thing as an unsafe place that people could say, they could talk about what they wish. And uh, But uh, under many circumstances, or in many venues, if I gave a talk on marriage, and I said, with respect to other opinions, that I only respect a marriage between a man and a woman, I am creating a toxic environment, an unsafe space, and I am intolerant. So, with, hence I'm giving a talk on marriage, the theology and anthropology of marriage. Let's go to Genesis. Very interesting to note that Genesis uh, narrates the creation story, but with particular purpose. Genesis is about the dignity of the human person. And I would say the first 
three chapters is the first major revelation of God, and it is about marriage. It's about human dignity, and then immediately after describing the first human being, who was a man, Adam, made, he's a special creature, he is different than the rest of the material creation, because he is an image of God, God reveals that he transcends creation, and he gives him the mandate to name each creature, which means that given the dignity and the elevated being of Adam, he is empowered to know the nature of all the creation. He has, an, he has insight because of his mind, which reflects the mind of God in a very finite way, to dominate creation. As he knows more and more about the, the material world, he can dominate it. He doesn't take absolute ownership. He's a steward, but because he's an image of God. He's not God, he's an image of God. Very shortly through Genesis, I mean, I'm not reading it because I want to get through this whole thing, uh, he, he is described as being alone, that he felt alone. And uh, maybe if Genesis were, were written in the 21st century, maybe the reaction would be, well, get, get a couple of dogs and you won't be alone. Uh, well, so uh, anyway, he had all the, you know, it was before the fall, so apples behaved, uh, leopards were nice, lions were nice, monkeys uh, served as nice companions, but he still never, nevertheless felt alone because there's no creature that corresponded to his dignity. There was no creature that he could love in the fullest sense of the word. So he was lonely. Just to, by way of illustration, um, at my age, people become widows and widowers, and uh, they have kids, and their, their spouse dies, and they're open to marry again, and their kids give them a bit of pushback. They don't want them to marry, and they consult with yours truly. There's plenty of rules and regulations. I'm not going to make up more than what you're entitled to find a spouse. I mean, uh, yeah, but I'm getting pushed back from my kids. Hey, well, then, I don't know, just hang out with your kids and uh, move on from there. And usually the reaction is, yeah, but I'm lonely. And, it does, and, and this person is not saying, well, I, I just need more people to come to my house for dinner or for coffee. I'm lonely means that I want a spouse. Okay. So, Adam is lonely, and the interpretation here is he feels incomplete. All right. In spite of the rich variety of the created world. So, he is made, so at, we, what is revealed, at least implicitly, is that Adam is made be complete, to relieve his loneliness. So, he, God creates another person, distinct, equal in dignity, but another person who is a complement to him. He contemplates this new person who's made from him, a woman, we have some women folk here, uh, enjoys even a higher dignity, not a metaphysical higher dignity, but what's revealed in Revelation is that, and I maybe wouldn't like this traditional word that man, Adam, is made from the slime of the earth. That's the original, <laughs> classical English translation. Now it's from the the slide has been removed in the new American Bible. Um, and women have been made from the rib of Adam. Uh, I don't know if it's literal, as God's show, he can do anything he wants, but woman is not made from the earth. Woman comes from Adam. And the, uh, Genesis is just reinforcing the special dignity of woman. And she's a helper of Adam, not in, sex, not in, in terms of servitude, but in what John, St. John Paul said in his letter on the dignity of woman, that the formation
formation of both men and women, especially men, are entrusted to women. That kind of help, to perfect them as persons, to perfect them, at least in the Christian sense too, as, as Christians as well. And so, so he contemplates Eve, and he is euphoric over Eve. He doesn't just say, hi, uh, great to meet you. You know, hopefully our, our, our paths will cross. He doesn't say that. He says, my gosh, bones of my bones, flesh of my flesh. And so the tone, even after millennia, is, I love this person. This person, had, it will relieve my loneliness. So he's euphoric over this. And God reveals the purpose of his relationship with this new human being who's a woman. Not, not a man, a woman, but made also in the image and likeness of God. And so God says, well, you know, you're not going to just be buddies. Uh, you're not going to hang out once in a while. Uh, you're going to leave your mother and father, and you're going to become one flesh. Well, what does that exactly mean? Is that uh, permission from God not to have your in-laws live with you? Uh, oh, I'm supposed to leave you, and uh, with a little bit of a sigh, in our weaker moments, maybe a sigh of relief. Well, you know, the Bible says I should leave my mother and father and become one flesh with my spouse, so no in-laws living with me. Uh, no, it doesn't say that. What goes on here is our closest relationship barring a marital relationship, is the relationship we have with our parents. Father's son, mother's son, daughter, father, daughter's mother. And God is saying, this love must go beyond the love you have for mother and father. It's the greatest human love. And I have given you, by the fact that I've created two distinct genders, you're empowered to love each other beyond the love you would have for your mother and father. Not because uh, she's better than your mother, or he's better than your father. No, the complementarity, the fact that there's a gender difference, empowers you to do that. So God's not going to command something that goes against nature. And he says that you will become one flesh. This is not meaning, you know, everybody literally is called to marriage. It doesn't mean that. And it doesn't mean that you're incomplete unless you have a spouse. Or, you know, if you have same-sex attraction, um, you know, you're shunned by God. We're talking again by, about marriage. That he is saying that you become one flesh, and we can look into this. Now, you're, inc you're incomplete. Because unity is always superior to partiality. Unity is kind of a, a, a perfection concept. And so to be full, it, it means a perfection, it means complete, it means fulfillment. And he says, you become, you're called to become one flesh. What does that mean? Well, you break it down, that it doesn't mean just physical one flesh. That's part of it. Uh, but it means emotional one flesh. And it means spiritual one flesh. I don't mean, well, you're called to pray together. No. The friendship between a man and a woman also produces one flesh. Flesh doesn't, is not exclusive to physicality. One flesh is a broad term that takes in the psychological and the spiritual. Just to illustrate spiritual a little bit, uh, one of my one gentlemen who sees me, young man looking for a uh, potential spouse, uh, met somebody in one of these, I don't know which parish it was, maybe some St. Alphonsus, doesn't matter, and young adults gathering, and, <coughs> and, or theology on tap, one of those kind of uh, affairs. And so he said, he met someone, he said, hey, let's have a, have a glass of Sprite or something better. Uh, and uh, so they went and uh, they talked. He told me, you know, and I'm kind of amazed, you know. 
you know, we, if we go more than 15 minutes, uh, you know, we're staring at each other. He said, I went two and a half hours with her. Okay, what's going on here? There's the spiritual attraction. He said, yeah, she's just, I don't know, we become really good friends. I said, well, do you think about dating her? He said, well, maybe, but, you know, in terms of just friendship, it's, it's, it's there. So that's, that's what this one flesh business means. Shortly after he talks about this one flesh, that you complete each other by this union, physical, psychological, spiritual, uh, he gives a mandate to them. Because one flesh is indispensable for the next mandate he gives. He says, he doesn't say, you may want to multiply. Okay, think about it. Or you may want to delay multiply. He says, the purpose of this one flesh business is that you multiply. So you, so we, God gives the purpose of this becoming one flesh. He says, the purpose is that you perpetuate the, the human person throughout the earth. And is that the exclusive purpose of marriage of this union between man and woman. It's not the exclusive, but it's an essential purpose. God, when he says one flesh, he says, well, it's to relieve that loneliness, it's to practice, in the words of uh, John Paul, in his theology of the body, this total gift of self. He establishes that, you're called to this total gift of self, becoming one flesh, and the purpose of this total gift of flesh is to personify your love for each other in new people, new human beings. Lastly, he says that this one flesh institution is exclusive. That is going to be your highest love. And when you have a highest love, it's an exclusive love. Doesn't mean there's no other loves, but it's an exclusive love. And there's a number of properties of exclusive love. It's got to be for life. It's got to be permanent. If love is not permanent, it's not the fullness of love. Uh, it's got to be, if it's exclusive, it's one man, one woman. And it has to be faithful love and sacrificial love. I mean, that's implied when, you know, Adam and Eve are no longer 19 years old, but now 90 years old. That this is a lifelong love that is also sacrificial and faithful. So that so that's the institution of marriage, and the, you know, the highlights of that. And it gets wrapped up with God saying, both to Adam and Eve, in their marital state, these, this, these two are images and likenesses. We have made them, and notice that in Genesis, God never says, I, he says, we, the illusion to the truth. We have made them in our image and likeness. So he's told, he says, Adam has made it our image and likeness, Eve, and then both of them together are made in their image and likeness, which reflects the blessed Trinity. That what's going on in the Trinity is that God the Father, God the Son, love each other so much that it's personified in another person that we call the Holy Spirit. I mean, that's the, that's the, uh, I'm doing an, inju an injustice to this because it takes a year to study this kind of stuff, so I don't know. Uh, hopefully I won't be burnt at the stake or in heresy. But that's the, the marital state is a reflection of the truth. All right, let's look at marriage in light of human reason, uh, the anthropology of marriage. I think we want to just touch on very basic philosophical premises just to see that Marriage between a husband and a wife, or a man and a woman, is, by light of human reason, the only real marriage. Okay. First, we have to invoke the principle of non-contradiction. Anytime we do philosophy, at least, if we're going to use Aristotle and Plato and Aquinas, um, and I would say any philosophy, if they're going to be intellectually honest, um, that you have to invoke the principle of non-contradiction. Uh, in other words, I can't be something one way, I, I can't be something, I 
and something else at the same time. Two plus two either equals four, equals four, but it can't equal four and five. It can't exist in the same way at the same time in a contradictory way. I can't, I can't be a man at the same time be a woman. I can't, it can't be raining and at the same time be sunny. In a court of law, you always invoke this. Uh, I know I have a bunch of lawyers here. But um, if I'm on trial, they said, were you at Walgreens when all the cologne was ripped off uh, at, uh, you know, Saturday night at 7.45? Where were you? Oh, I was um, in my room praying my breviary. So either, and someone says, well, I saw him stealing the cologne. So someone is right and someone is wrong. Someone is telling the truth, someone is telling the telling the lie. Because either I really was in my room reading my divine office, and I I'm telling the truth, or I'm being, or yeah, I'm falsely accused, or I'm lying, because I really did steal the cologne. Um, so that's the principle of non contradiction. You can't be one way and another way at the same time. And we're going to apply that to the uh, marital institution. The other thing we want to look at, uh, which is another philosophical premise, these are truths that are self-evident. In other words, you can't prove them because they're self-evident. They're premises. Do good and avoid evil is another premise, uh, is another philosophical principle. Can I prove do good and avoid evil? I can't prove it. I know it by the fact that I'm a human. And so, I don't need to read the Ten Commandments to know that I should not, when he leaves the room to get more coffee, to take his notebook. Or he wants to get more coffee and I steal his roll. Uh, <laughs> he would say, well, let me look at the Bible to see if that was wrong. And I, you know it's wrong because you're a human being and I'm a human being. Or if I, you know... I need, you know, I'm getting bored with my own talk, and I'm starting to lull myself to sleep, and I run to the coffee machine there and step on someone's toe and apologize. Probably the person will say, "Listen, don't worry about getting your coffee and continue to talk." I have, to get, I have to get to work. If I stepped on someone's toe, I said, "I hope it hurt." <laughs> I've lost a friend. At least, you know. So there is. So we have an innate knowledge of uh, what's right and what's wrong. It's self-evident. Because if I said, well, can you prove that stepping on your toe on purpose is wrong? Uh, you would not dignify that statement because you say, it's written, I know it. Okay. Uh, can I steal, can I at the same time uh, be in my room reading a book and at the same time stealing cologne? No. Because of personal non contradiction. All right, we're going to see, we're going to look at, we're going to apply those principles briefly to marriage. Let's, you know, and I know there's uh, there's variations, you know, but we're going to look, we're, again, we're looking at marriage here. Um, a, a human being, and anatomically, is either a man or a woman. Prove it. It's self-evident. Well, I know it's not self-evident out there in the culture, but it's self-evident. I mean, people say that the male anatomy or the female anatomy is, if you say there's a difference, it, that's a social construct. Because at best, these are appendages that don't define a man or a woman. I'm not saying that you know anatomy exclusively defines a man or a woman. But it is a property that comes from the nature. Aristotle and Plato Aquinas say that you have a nature and certain properties spin off of that nature and certain actions spin off of that nature. So a female nature will have an anatomy of a female. A male nature will have the anatomy of a male. I'm not talking about you know birth defects or anything like that. What else is... So there's gender differences. That is self-evident. I would say if you don't recognize that, I know I could be uh, lynched. Uh, 
uh, you're not being intellectually honest. It's sort of like me stepping on someone's toe on purpose and saying, listen, you know, what makes that wrong? Well, maybe it's right to step on someone's toe on purpose. Um, or maybe it's wrong not to step on someone's toe on purpose. And it's silly. Uh, there is a mutual attraction between a man and a woman. I'm not saying every case. I know it's not every case. But that anatomy of a woman and a man are at the service of a mutual attraction that's complementary. There's a mutual attraction in terms of emotion. I would say that the biggest attraction is not physical. It's, it's attraction. I'll tell you that. It's emotional. And when someone has fallen in love, uh, it's not, well, that person's physical form is caused me to go gaga. No, that person has caused me to go gaga. The physical could be, is included. But when, when someone mad, falls madly in love, that's because of an emotional attraction. I would say that's the strongest attraction. And that is self-evident. Um... You, when someone is kind of in a little bit of a better mood, or he's, especially in the case of guys, you know, they're behaving a little bit better, they're a little bit nicer. Uh, the you know the standard cliche is, "Are you in love?" And men have to say, "Yeah, I yeah. am," you know, because of this mutual attraction. And then there is uh, a complementarity. This person, and this happens a lot, you probably you marry people. Experience it. This long conversation, we were on the phone, and you know, people have exams and got people to go to work. They talk to their girlfriend or fiance or vice versa in another state, another part of the country, and they go, you know, two hours, or they're texting for, you know, uh, inordinate amounts of time because of this spiritual attraction. And why? Well, because there's a complementarity there that does not occur, you know, under other circumstances, only when there is an attraction between a male and a female. So, what do we see here? More self-evident that a male and a female are made for intimate friendship. And they're made for physical intimacy. And there's a, there's a driving force because of this complementarity, this physical driving force, this emotional driving force, this spiritual driving force, one can say, well, why is that? Well, if I had a, a specimen on a slide, okay, this is a sexual part of, of the body. You know, that's, that's not going to produce any attraction. There's nothing in physicality or the, the histology or the physiology or the biochemistry that is attractive. Uh, flesh is flesh. You know, whether it's, you know, a toe, whether it's an earlobe, or whether it's part of the sexual anatomy. What's attractive is the female person, the male person. It's the, it's the, it's the gender complementarity that draws the two sexes together. So, that is, and that, that, that's a spin-off of the nature of man and woman. I'm not, I know it's not in every case, but the majority of the cases. Um, also, this physical attraction, we go back to Genesis, at least a, a man is attracted, at least physically, and maybe, you know, Everything's a unit here, and probably emotionally as well, to a woman of childbearing age. I haven't met anybody who, you know, a 50 year old man or a 40 year old man or a 25 can love an 80 year old woman. Really love, be very close friends. But I have a probably 99% of the time, and I think I'm being conservative, uh, he won't fall in love with. Why? Because you know, so she's too old. No, yeah, but she's told because she's not a 
if she was 80 years old and she took some special potion and looked as if she was 28 years old, hey, I can live you. A 25-year-old guy can fool an 80-year-old woman who looks 25. You know, and the age is not it. And what, what am I, what's the point I'm trying to make? That this complementarity is at the service of life, of new life. Exclusively? No. Not exclusive. But that is an essential part of this complementarity. The very fact that under normal circumstances, and usually, uh, one of the spouses, the majority of the time, I know you get married after you, in your older years, but usually it's one of the spouses, probably both, but one of the spouses is of child, the woman is of childbearing age. The man is, can, uh, he can, he can sire a child until he's significantly old, it depends on the health of the man. So, so we see this. So this complementarity, because God, why is it a powerful complementarity? <laughs> because of this need to produce new life. And also other reasons as well. To, to reveal also the fullness of the love of God the Father, who motherly love and fatherly love on a human level equally reflect the love of the Father. And this, as a number of married couples have told me, so the best way to reveal to my kids how much God loves me is by the love I have for my spouse. That if we really love each other and grow in our love, we are revealing to them. And I know from my pastoral work, guys and girls have issues with their fathers. Uh, I had a kid who mother because this love was lacking in the home. So these are these are self-evident ideas that come out of contemplating uh, marriage. Um, let's look at just a bit more that why can't, let's look at gay marriage. Why can't that be recognized as a marriage. We have to go back to those philosophical principles of what marriage is. How do we define it? What are the properties of marriage? We, we're, we're really stressing complementarity. I want to stress physical comp complementarity without getting into excessive detail. I would say this one flesh physicality is like a puzzle. The you know, physical marital union is like a puzzle. The anatomy has been made, and to go back to John Paul's theology of the body, I think he alludes to the fact that of all the, of the material creation, of all the living creation, the sexual characteristics of the human being are the most pronounced. Um, I don't know if you've had the same experience, but when I go to someone's house and they have a dog, I always get the gender mixed up. Know if you really look hard, you'll determine that. I'm not that naive. But usually, you know, hey, he's cute. Oh, it's a she. Okay. She's cute. It's a he. Because the, the, the gender differences aren't all that pronounced. With the human person, they are. And John Paul says that the human, he talks about the theology of nakedness. He said that nakedness bespeaks about this total gift of self. And that contemplating the human body uh, is sort of, uh, it points to their total gift of self to each other, and the personification, which is being, this total gift of self is made to personify that love in a new human being. And they both fit like a puzzle. Their, their anatomy and their structure is made for this cleave to one another, the word used in Genesis, and when you have this cleaving to one another, uh, God intervenes and creates a new human being. That's why uh, conception is called procreation, because the mother and the father cooperate through their love for each other uh, in creating a new human being. So if, now I, we have to use certain principles. If I say, well, marriage, the purpose of marriage is not to have kids, well, then it, it's harder to 
uh, talk about the objective truth of marriage. But we want to be intellectually honest. The physical union of someone of the same sex is not life-giving. And whether the doctor agrees or not, he will say anatomically, they are not. They don't fit together like a puzzle. They don't complete each other like a puzzle. In fact, what they'll say is that it's, it, it damages your, it can damage your health. It's, it's dangerous uh, to the body, and I'll you know, defer to physicians on that one. But they, they say that just, you know, you're physically not made. They, at the same time, they say, well, you're, you have a right. I've heard that, too, you know, uh, from physicians. You have a right to same-sex union, even though they will contend that you're not, it doesn't fit like a puzzle like the, the, the man and the woman. Um, this complementarity doesn't occur there, and it's, it doesn't really fit that someone, same sex, right? Says, listen, I'm going to leave my mother and father and become one flesh. But I think with, when we look at uh, same sex marriage, we need to always look at the purpose of this marriage. And we, we also define marriage as a complementary, permanent, faithful union. Again, it doesn't hold order. Now, you may say, well, let's look at it. Well, I don't care what you say. I don't think it's the purpose of marriage is, uh, is life-giving. You know, I, who are you to define marriage for me? Okay, I've had that. Um, who are you to say that it has to be complementary? That's just a social construct. That's a product of uh, the biases of Western civilization, or even Christianity. Well, not as biased as natural law, or Greek philosophy, or Eastern philosophy, etc. Um, and who are you to say that? And I remember, I tell this anecdote a little bit, I, you know, some lazy afternoon visiting this elderly person. You know, I was trying to do a good thing. And uh, she had invited some of her grandchildren. That was kind of nice, you know, a cup of coffee, you know, 22 degrees out, it's winter, gray, little uh, snow flurries, nice and warm. And we're talking, it's kind of fun. And this girl there says, um, I resent that it's taken so long to legalize gay marriage. So I said to myself, no, you don't have to stay here. This is you're know, you here, you're enjoying yourself, she invited you, and you're going to leave early anyway. <laughs> so, and she presses it more. I said, please stop, so I don't want to ruin the afternoon. And I don't want to get a guilt trip by saying nothing, because I really didn't want to say anything. Um, so I said, she continued. She said, tell me, it's, it's good. This so called Christianity just uh, repressing people's legitimate inclinations. So I said, oh gosh. Took a few deep breaths. And just, just went out. I just, that's bad. She said, what? Aren't you a little bit narrow? You know, kind of condescending. I don't know, maybe. Um, said, you know, it's that kind of position that hurts so many. Let's just, can you follow my logic and let's see what you think? And I, and I said, you know, maybe I'm flawed, maybe I'll give more consideration to what you're saying. Just try to be nice. Uh, went over like a lead balloon. But anyway, I, I said, well, maybe I don't want to marry someone of my gender. I don't have same sex attraction, maybe I don't have heterosexual attraction. But I am a dog lover, and I'd like to marry a dog. She says, Get real. I go, I am real. I don't marry my dog. He says, Listen, you know, we're not going to pursue this if you're not serious. I go, I am serious. And I said, Okay, let's look, use another analogy that is much more realistic and, and real. Uh, I'm in Utah. And women. Some of the Mormon women agree with polygamy. They do. Yeah. Right, so I know that. And uh, listen, I'm a Mormon. I want to marry three girls. I don't want just one. I want three. I'm not attracted to one. 
I need three to be fulfilled. And she didn't want, she said, let's take this one. So said, why? Why can't I do that? Because what she was doing was she was contradicting the principle of non-contradiction, that you could be one thing and another thing at the same time, the same way. Basically, she was saying that uh, marriage is not between a man and a woman. Okay, it's not between a man and a woman. Then what is it? Well, it's between two people with same-sex attraction. Well, why? Okay, it, it's either man and woman or same-sex attraction. Well, it, it should be same-sex attraction. Okay, well, let's extend that. Because what are you basing your opinion on a marriage that doesn't involve a man and a woman? I mean, what? And you may ask me, what are you doing on? I'm doing it on uh, self-evident, objective truth. Just like I know it's gray out. Just like I know that the light is on. Just like I know that I've got men and women in this room. Just like I know that I can't steal someone's uh, wallet or phone or step on someone's toe. These are self-evident. Now, once now the problem is, well, why can't you convince more people? Because the principle of non-contradiction, the objectivity of a, of a nature, is being denied. And it is, and I would say it lacks logic because you are defining marriage in a way that has no objectivity. What the, what makes a marriage then? If uh, two people of the same gender could marry. What makes it? What defines a marriage? And who are you to define marriage? And well, from a pre-Christian and a Christian perspective, that this natural law reflects the eternal wisdom of God. Lastly, uh, if you have, I'm going to stop here. Uh, in terms of logic, I had this. You know, they didn't roll their eyes and and insult me, but uh, someone said, well, who are you? Again, this, who are you? Who are you to frustrate someone's legitimate inclinations? I'm not here to frustrate anyone's legitimate inclinations. And it's not, you know, not even to say, well, you know, you have heterosexual attraction versus same sex. I'm not even talking about that. But you say, well, you have an inclination, you should fulfill it. And uh, some say, well, and it's genetically determined that you have same-sex attraction. Could be, I don't know. I'm not, I, I don't know. But that's not the point. The point, let's look at the logic here. Let's, because I, I, alcoholism, too, is genetically determined. Say, it's, you know, it's genetic, it's hereditary. Mom, no, my grandfather's an alcoholic, my father's an alcoholic. Okay. Well, I, I've gotten to two, well, three, but one of my younger days, two very bad accidents. I got wise like a cat, I should have been killed twice. Um, one, when I was a teenager, drove me to a telephone pole, and the thing broke, and the transformer came down, and I was covered, it was super official, I was covered in blood. Right. Uh, I have a bad back, but you know, I'm still here. You're stuck with me. And the, when the police came and started to interrogate this person, he said, Well, probably he, this was genetically determined. So, you know, we're going to just wash our hands of that. I wasn't too consoled either. It was genetically determined. You, it ain't, uh, it fulfilling an inclination that will harm the common good or violates the dignity is an inclination that should be controlled or even, in a certain sense, suppressed. Uh, why only when it comes to marriage I could fulfill an inclination that does not correspond to objective morality? And I told this person, well, you're, are you sure you want to say that, that I can fulfill my inclination? Are you sure? Say, I am sure. And I said, well, let's look at Thomas Aquinas. Thomas Aquinas says, well, you violate, when you contradict natural law and the teaching of the church in the case of Catholics, there's a lack of logic. It's not that you're just wrong. There's a lack of logic. I have bad temper. And when I lose my temper, I feel better. I'm relieved. It's an outlet. So, you know, all I need to do is insult a couple of people in the morning and I'm good to go for the rest of the day. I, I said, can I do that? 
You know, well, no, but the, 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 you're missing the point. I mean, what's the point here? Uh, so, can I ma marry, marry when it's not a, in reality a marriage? When it contradicts the parameters, the properties of nature of marriage. So we can't just use that, you know, mantra of, you know, people have a right to fulfill their inclinations. Uh, if, I, if someone is inclined to be a racist, I would say you got to suppress that inclination. you got to really control that. Or someone has lustful desires, you know, it, it seems like we, we want it both ways. And, you know, there's a lot of harassment out there. Uh, obviously there is, unfortunately. But if everybody's free to fulfill his inclinations, why are all these uh, you know, important people being berated in the press? Because it's objectively wrong to fulfill your inclinations if it's a violation of your dignity or somebody else's dignity in terms of sexual harassment and the common good. So these are a few points that, you know, to uh, make a case why I, I never thought of my father's dreams that I have to make a case uh, that marriage is uh, by natural law, by divine revelation, and by human anthropology, uh, a union, a community between man and woman. Thank you very much. <laughs> Any questions? If disagree, yell at me. Go to work if you have to. Yes, Pete. Does it seem contradictory that um, there, there seems to be a, a with, in, the, in the case of the woman who was kind of questioning you at the fireside chat? Yeah. Um, it seems like there is a, a desire on her part for a social acceptance of her opinion. Yes, definitely. Um, and yet, uh, you know, and, and then you're kind of proclaiming objectivity. Yes. Um, and so, you know, it seems like there there are laws that say, you know, you shall not steal, you shall not do this. There's, there's, there's the, the, the objective right and wrong of it. Yes. There's a commandment. But yes. there's also legal um, ramifications to it and legal support of it. Yes. So, um, but the legal support behind the, the issues of natural law and yeah. right and wrong, yes. do they, are, are they contradictory, are, are they contradictory to the legal support that would be uh, in support of something that is of natural law, that is, that is contradictory? I say in our legal system right now, we do have laws that violate natural law, like the destruction of the unborn, uh, like single sex marriage. Um, and the Christian Aquinas will say that a law is not a real law if it doesn't, if it contradicts natural law. If it doesn't, you, you are bound to obey that law. And what we have in this uh, culture is called legal positivism. Uh, the Constitution was modeled after the natural law, but we see we have, there's a lot of good in that. We we look at the law, the civil law is an absolute. It's not an absolute. Law is only law if it reflects objective morality. And there's a there's a number of there's laws now that don't. And so the the moral person, I was going to say Christian, the moral person is obligated in conscience to disobey that law, which is just a sham. Um, do it with prudence, uh, pick your battles, but there's a number of laws that are severely in contradiction to basic natural moral principles. Yes, sir? Question, how do you separate the mentality? How do you explain the dignity of the marriage and the sense of marriage as a natural right? Well, that's going to be, I think, if they invite me again, that'll be my next talk, but just a short answer, because that's, that's, that's a long, that's not a class. Um, uh, a marriage is still a marriage, even if it's not life-giving. You have to be open to life. If you get married, that's a 
grounds for annulment, and one of the parties does not have kids whatsoever, uh, then it's not a valid marriage. Um, but marriage should be, at least in terms of marital relations, uh, it should be open to life. Uh, because that's the purpose of marital relations. Is it the only one? No, it's not. But it is uh, an essential purpose of marital relations. Yes, Dan. Father, you gave an example earlier uh, regarding marriage of uh, a younger man and a 80 year old woman. Yes. But the man wouldn't be attracted to her because she could not bear children. Um, and then you said, but if she could take a potion and appear to be 25 and then bear children, right. that would change. Yes. Uh, suppose she could take that potion but not appear to be 25, but she could bear children. You could, but you're asking uh, something very difficult for a guy to marry someone who's not physically attractive. I mean, one thing is loving, you know, and love could be even higher than a marital love, I mean, from you know, the heart of Christ. But in terms of marrying someone who doesn't, if, if you don't begin with eros, which is I'm attracted, you know, marital love begins with that eros, uh, it's probably not going to happen. Yes, sir. Yes, Jim. So, uh, a social acceptable way to make the point you did about Aquinas and natural law and positive law is to invoke Martin Luther King. He made that precise point that was my civil disobedience. Yes. And as you recall, this letter from Birmingham jail, he quotes Aquinas not precisely that point. Exactly, that's right. He did. So, he did. so you want to refuge yourself in a socially acceptable way to make that point. I like that. Without, uh, without getting A. <laughs> that's why this guy's a crackerjack lawyer. Okay. Yes, Mark. So, so many of our young kids obviously are growing up in a culture where this is the accepted norm. Yes. So what kind of arguments and conversations do you think have been most successful in your conversations with young people to open their eyes? Okay. Yeah, off, off the record, I mean, if I would begin this way, I wouldn't be able to give the talk. But what I do, because it's not that, as you know and I know, I mean, I gave a similar talk at the University of Chicago, and I just saw some of the kids, you know, they're kind of stunned uh, because they never heard this before, believe it or not. And uh, it sounded super politically incorrect, but it was logical. I think it was. I hope it was, or somewhat logical. And so they were kind of stumped, you know. And usually they're asking questions, and a lot of them didn't. Um, some, when I gave a pro-life talk, two walked out. And it wasn't because I had to do a term paper, they just didn't like it. Um, so I was just kind of relieved that nobody walked out. I would say put them in contact with uh, young families who have children and have good marriages. Uh, what I've done, uh, you know, I'm not saying this is the ultimate solution. I'm telling you. I, I asked some young couples to go to the novena at St. Mary the Angels, not because of the preaching or even the music, but to see young couples with kids. Uh, that, I said, that speaks to itself. I mean, I don't like to lead with, oh my gosh, the culture is advocating gay marriage. I think I like to lead with, okay, you know, just take a look and, and determine. Or just good Christian loving marriages are very attractive. So I think that's probably the best witness, but that doesn't mean that we're off the hook in explaining things. But I think the, the, the witness of, of, of marriage, I mean, I like, I, mean, I don't have time, but I like visiting uh, families with kids, and, you know, where, where the husband and wife really love each other. I'm not saying that things just are smooth sailing, but there's a, it's, it's a witness right there. It's a witness that of the validity of a good Christian marriage. Any other questions? I don't want you late for it. All right, let's finish with Hail Mary. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Jesus, Mary, and Joseph, pray for us in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Oh, thank you very much.